book of Acts chapter 26. Praise the Lord. Acts 26, and just one verse there, verse 19. This is the Apostle Paul. He's come out, and they're, uh, they, he, 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 they're, 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 he's in prison, or they are taking him to jail. They're accusing him of, of uh, you know, just bringing chaos to every city that he comes to. He's preaching the gospel, doing what God called him to do. And they bring him because they brought him to jail. He said, this guy, this guy is a troublemaker. And so he's explaining what he's doing. And then here in verse 19, he tells the king. He says, so then King Agrippa, he's, he's, he tells him, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. That's it. He says, everything that brought me to to where I am right now in front of you, in trouble. Everything that got me here, he says, has to do with me not being disobedient to the vision that God gave me. Father, one more time, I pray that as we speak on vision, that it will be real to every one of our lives, right where we are today. And Father, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Vision, according to the dictionary, says that vision is the ability to see. Hello. But then also, there's a couple of the definitions there that I really, really like in regards to vision. Not only is the ability to see, the natural, but also is an unusual discernment or foresight. An unusual discernment or foresight, he says. And then also he says that is a supernatural appearance that conveys a revelation. In other words, uh, uh, it's able to have a dream, to have a vision that it becomes so real in your life that you pursue it. Okay, a supernatural appearance that conveys a revelation. Now, in that verse that we read, Paul had received a vision from God of what God wanted here on earth. And Paul simply went about doing his part to see that vision, God's vision, God's plan being fulfilled. That's all. Paul understood what God wanted because God revealed a certain vision to him. And Paul dedicated his life and he went about doing his part in seeing God's vision and God's plan to come to pass. That's what he did. He got busy doing the work of God, accomplishing God's vision. Now, when we talk about vision, especially here in our ministry of Victory Outreach and as people of God, we always talk, and I always like to break it down in three different categories when we talk about vision. I say that vision is, first of all, is personal. Each and every one of us must develop, acquire from the Lord a personal vision. What does that mean? God has a plan for you personally, for you individually. God has a plan for each and every one of us individually. And we must begin there. I remember when I first came to the Lord, and, 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 and I was, again, I was depressed, oppressed, taking medication. I was suicidal. It was, it was a mess. But when I came to the Lord, and, 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 and I started, you know, coming to the services and hearing the Word of God, right away, God started uh, 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 reviving. He started to revive some dreams inside of my heart. Come on now. God started to give me some personal desires, a personal vision for myself, for my family, for, you know, in every area of my own personal life. And that's what God does. When you begin to hear the word of God, God has a way of, you know, speaking to us. The Bible says that the word of God is alive and active. When you hear the word of God being preached, something happens inside of us. So I say that vision, vision, when we talk about vision, it must first begin at a personal level. 
It has to begin with you, with you individually. Forget about everybody else right now that is around you. And think about this. God has a vision for me. Just like that. Because he does. You got to make it personal. And you got to be able to see you're married. You're not just, you know, his wife. Hello, somebody. God has a vision for you, a plan for you personally, individually. Not just for your husband. Not just for your wife. As a son or a daughter, you are here today. Can I tell you something? God has a personal vision for you. And he wants to revive that inside of you so that you understand that God is a personal God. And he's got a plan for your own personal life. God is a good God. Come on. Can I hear an amen here? See, <coughs> not only does it have to begin with having a personal vision, but also... When we get saved and we come to church, we begin to get from the Lord a local vision. We begin to see the local vision. What we have as a church here in the North Bay. What we have here in Santa Rosa. Where is the church? Uh, 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 what is the vision of the church, of the local house here in Santa Rosa? What is it that, that God has called us personally and also corporately here in Santa Rosa to do? And then when we begin to see the local vision of the church here in Santa Rosa, where we are now, here in the North Bay, then you begin to ask God, God, what is my part in the local vision that you have in this house? What is my part, my involvement? How can I facilitate? How can I help for this personal vision that you have locally to come to pass? What is my part, Lord? You begin to think like that because that's, and you begin to ask God, show me, Lord. Show me. Give me the dreams. Give me your plan. Give me the vision. Just like you gave it to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, man, I, I, I've been living my life, King Agrippa, and I want to let you know that I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. I'm doing what God has called me to do. When you begin to be involved and get involved into what God called you to do, you begin to enter a new level of experience of real life that God intended for each and every one of us. Life without purpose is meaningless. Hello, somebody. And when God, when you enter into God's vision, God's purpose for your life, something happens. You become alive because things begin to be uh, 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 awakened inside of you. So a personal vision is important. Then the local vision is very important. How can I... Get involved. What is my part in seeing your vision for this local church, this local city, this county come to pass? And then, of course, the third uh, category that I talk about a lot is the global vision. I thank God that we belong to a ministry that is international and global. You was able to see and to hear from uh, a, 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 a young lady here. Uh, that is, she is on her way. Her and her husband, the whole family is going to Amsterdam because there's a need there. And we have a, a ministry that believes in reaching the world. There's needs all over the world. We have one of our very own who in a couple of months, you're going to see him being prayed for and sent out with his children all the way to the other side of the world, to South Africa. Can I tell you something? Some of you are called. and Some of you will be called. Some of you are going to find out that God called you to be a part of the international vision soon and very soon. You're going to be able to sense that calling. So it's not only just a, a personal thing, how you want to improve my life, God, and how you want me to get a better job, and how you want me to get a, you know, my family to another level and all that, or personal. But then also, how can I get involved in the local vision, accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish, establishing a base here in Santa Rosa that we will be able to financially and leadership and with missionaries and pastors, send them all over the world to be able to make a difference around the world you'll be able to understand and be committed because there's a purpose much bigger than any one of our lives alone it's a bigger vision it's a bigger purpose and we belong to a wonderful wonderful ministry that is dedicated to reaching a hurting world i'm amazed to see pastor sunny senior uh, go all over the world even though he's getting a little older hallelujah but he goes all over the world, from South Africa to Panama to Europe, 
all over the world to provide leadership, to be able to continue to guide and to give his wisdom in establishing not only the churches, but bases that would take continents for the honor and the glory of God. This is what we're talking about here this morning. But it begins with a personal vision. And today, I want to talk a little bit on the first step, which is the personal vision. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. You see, the personal vision is a must that we would have a personal vision. Vision is the ability to see, unusual discernment, or foresight. So the personal, the local, and the global are very important. Now I want to give you common steps, some steps that are very common to the fulfillment of a vision. And I'm going to speak about step number one. That it, This is a must. If you're going to see any vision or if you're going to see any dreams that God is giving you, at the personal level, if you're going to see any of those things come to pass in your life, you must, you must begin here. Okay? I want to talk today about step number one to seeing the fulfillment of your vision. And that is to have the right attitude. It all begins with the right attitude. Can I tell you something? Your vision, your dream... Your calling that God has upon your life will never come to pass with the wrong attitude. Will never come to pass if you have a wrong attitude. Attitude is very, very, very important. The right attitude. Either you are going to have an attitude of faith, what I call a winning attitude, or you are going to have an attitude of fear, where I call a defeated attitude in regards to your calling, in regards to your dream, in regards to God's vision for your life, for your marriage, in regards to God's vision and God's plan for your business, for your own personal ministry, for your calling in your life. The right attitude is a must. See, attitude of faith is always active. It's always learning to trust and to depend on God according to His Word. You see what God says? And according to His Word, you learn to trust Him more and more and more. According to the promises that He's given you, you continue to, in the good times and in the tough times, continue to lean on Him more and more. You learn to trust Jesus more and more. But an attitude of fear... It's a negative attitude. Whenever trials, challenges, and problems come up as you're pursuing that vision or that purpose in your life, whenever trials, challenges, and problems come up, they are perceived with fear and with a defeated attitude. It's almost as if, no, it's impossible. I can't do that. No, I'm facing this. No, I'm facing that. And that's a defeated attitude. Because if you are going to pursue a dream from God, a vision from the Lord, you would always face opposition. You're not just going to be able to build that business without opposition. You're not just going to be able to build your marriage to the point, oh, man, we got it, without opposition. There's always going to be opposition if you want to graduate from college or not, from high school. There's always going to be opposition when you want to do good things and you want to go beyond the norm. Come on now. There's always going to be opposition. And you must understand that in this opposition on your way of the accomplishment of the vision, you're going to have to have, you're going to have a choice to make. Either you are going to see your challenges as opportunities or you are going to see your challenges with an attitude of fear. And you are going to stop, or you're going to give up, or you're going to walk away, 
or you're going to say, man, maybe this wasn't from God just simply because there's opposition, because there's challenges in front of you, or you're going to buckle up and say, I'm going to trust God. I know what he said. I know what he told me, and I'm going to trust and believe God that somehow, some way, he is going to make it work because it is he that called me to do it, and because of that, I will continue pushing forward in spite of the opposition that I'm facing today. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a good praise because I believe that we're moving forward as a people of God. This is the attitude of fear. It's a negative attitude. It reminds me of the man who got home from work. Remember that? The minute that he walked into his house, he says, what stinks in this house? Then he went into his room to hang his jacket because he was late. He came from work. And when he got into his room, opened the door. What smells in this room? Hung the jacket and he went. He says, man, I got to get out of here. He went to the backyard, opened the door. And at the minute that he took a deep breath, oh, what stinks out here? He ran back into the house upset. And as he's running, he went right by the mirror. And when he looked on the mirror a little bit, he saw a white thing over here on his face. So he stopped and he looked. It was a, it was a piece of cheese, old cheese hanging on his mustache right here. Right under his nose. From that morning, from that breakfast, all day that cheese has been on his, on, his, on his mustache. So now it was stinking bad. Do you know there's people like that? Actually, they live real life and live real life with stinky cheese on their mustache. Come on now. See, you see, what you need to know is this. The smell was never out there somewhere. The smell was on him. That was the bad part. That smell followed him everywhere he went. He couldn't get away from that bad smell because he had it on him. See, some people live their lives blaming and doing and doing. Everything stinks. Everything smells. Everything. But they, if they just stop for a moment and begin to take a self-inventory, and begin to understand. Let me look at myself on the mirror. The word of God. Why is my life so messed up? Why is everything negative? Why does everything smell? And you begin to understand. It's because there's a spirit of negativity in my life. And I got to deal with it. Or the vision will never come to pass in my life. Come on, somebody need to give a praise. You know what I'm talking about. Come on, look at your neighbor and, 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 and said, remove that cheese, brother. No, I'm just kidding. Amen, amen. Don't say that. You're going to get punched in the face. You see, my friend, so many people miss out on their God-given dreams and on God's promises for their lives. They give up pursuing the vision for their future. Not because something or someone out there is stopping them, but simply because they carry a negative, defeated, fearful attitude everywhere they go. You can't overcome, you can't have the victory with that type of attitude. You got to allow God to help you change that attitude. You see, these are people that everything is impossible. Everything is wrong everywhere they go. Everything stinks. Hello, somebody. But if truth be told, every one of us has been given the authority and the power from God to be able to press the reset button inside of our hearts. Come on now. In our lives, from negative, defeated attitude to the right attitude to the winning attitude. Come on now. To the champion attitude. God has given us access and God is giving us authority to be able to change that with the help from God. You don't have to live like that. We don't have to remain like that. It is a choice that you and I make. To remain negative. 
to remain negative in everything that we do or everything that we see. And by doing that, we forfeit God's plan and the fulfillment of God's plan and God's vision for our own personal lives. Did God give you a dream of what he wants you to do and what he has for your life? I'm going to tell you something right now and make it a lot easier for you. It's time to begin to take a deep inventory of your life. And when you find things that are negative in your life, you can reset that button yourself. I'm going to tell you something. I can't, even if I wanted to, I can't come and change your attitude. Okay, let me get a little deeper on this side because I didn't get too good of a response last side. But let me see, on this side it's going to be better. Let me tell you, I'm going to get a little deeper here. God himself cannot change your attitude. He wants to. He can't change your attitude. Do you know that he gave you access and he gave you authority? He will teach you. He, he, he will bring the truth. He will give you reasons why you should change the attitude. But to change your attitude has to do with your own choice, willingness, and your desire and making that step in changing that attitude. Come on. Yeah, there you go. There you go. They're responding. Come on now. They're responding. It is a choice. And you can never accomplish God's dreams for your life. It can be a beautiful dream. It could be a beautiful vision that God has for your life. It could be that you will be a person so instrumental to start a revival. To do something that's never been done before. But because we don't believe it. But because we are negative. But because we see everything wrong. Because all these different things. We will not be able to accomplish that. You will never be able to see the fulfillment. Of God's vision in your life if you remain negative. A negative attitude will kill any type of dream in your life. It will kill it. And no one has access to that button but you, yourself. I could never change you even if I wanted to. I'm, I'm having challenges changing myself. Hello, somebody. Let alone Changing somebody else. And I see negative attitudes all the time. And you like to avoid people with negative attitudes. You want to be around too many people. Oh, no, it's going to get me a bump, a bump kick over here. I hang around with that brother a little too long. Man. I'm going to start all depressed. Like, hey, I need medication myself. You hang around with negative people right away. It's bad. But I like the attitude of this boy. He was a baseball player, and he's, he's playing baseball. The first inning started, the first half of the first inning. And, and they took the field, and the pitcher started to throw. and Boom, home run. Oh, Jesus. A triple, a double. Bases loaded. Grand slam, another home run. So they're losing, they're losing 8 to 0 in the first inning. And then the father of this boy gets there a little late, and he comes running. And when he gets there, they just made the first three out, so they're coming to the dog out. And he sees his son coming. He says, hey, son, how we doing? And the little boy says, we're losing eight to zero. And the father, he didn't want to discourage his son, but he just came out of him, and he says, oh, man. So his boy heard what his dad said. He says, hey, dad. We're losing 8 to 0, but we're coming to bat next. He said, Dad, would you like to get the bat? I haven't got the bat yet. Dad, don't, 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 don't think we're, we're going to lose this one. They only score 8. <laughs> what a great attitude this guy had. 
I love to hang out with guys like this. That when things are not going well, they're going to stick it out. Then they're going to say, don't worry. Don't worry. God is on our side. We may be low. We may be down right now. But he's not going to stay like this. We're going to fight. We're going to do. Oh, just wait. Wait to see what God will do. He's about to get started. This is only the beginning. God will do greater things. Come on, somebody. Some people, because of their attitude, they give up too quick. Something happens. They got big dreams. They're, oh man, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. Oh man, God call me. And then the devil comes out and he says, "Boo! <laughs> I can't. I can't. I just can't. Why? Why can't you?" <sighs> <sighs> did you see what he did to me? What did he do? He stuck out his tongue. <sighs> People give up on their dream. They're a visionary. They want to take the world. Something happens and that's it. They fall apart. I used to fall apart at the beginning. You got to grow. You got to learn. Your dream is going to take sacrifice. You're going to get hit. You want to build a great family? You're going to get hit. You want to build a great marriage? You're going to get hit. You want to build a great ministry in a church? You're going to get hit. And if you don't know how to take it, if you don't know how to take it, you will run away. You will give up. You will go to the sideline. You will not be active no more. Why? Because I got hit. Oh, my friend, we want to raise up champions in Santa Rosa. That can take a hit and keep on moving forward and tell the devil, is that the hardest you can, is that the best you can do? Come on, somebody need to give them praise. Things are not going to stay the way they are. God will fight for us. Come on, give them a good praise. Only if you believe it. Yeah. Only if you have that kind of attitude. You have, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I don't think so. You don't know what I'm going through. I got a flat tire coming out of my house. Come on, go steal a tire or something. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just saying, it's, sometimes it's a simple fix. We get discouraged. Want to give up? God has so wonderful things for your own personal life, and you give up. People of God, God, God says, hey, you know, I want to take you guys from here. I see you suffering. I see your condition. I'm going to take you from here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to deliver you, and I'm going to put you in this wonderful place that I have for you. I'm giving you a promise. I want you to go. So all the people of God find deliverance, right? Boom, they come out. I'm talking, I'm talking about, I think about a million or something people or more. They come out of Egypt, and they're on their way. And Moses says, hey, go spy out the land. Go check out the place, the gift that God has given us. Check out the gift, the wonderful land. They said that there's the fruit. We haven't even seen how great the fruit is. We've never seen any fruit like, 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 like the one that they have, like the type of fruit they have over here. I want you to go check it out. They tell me that they chose 12 leaders from the 12 different tribes. One leader from each tribe. Leaders. Hello, somebody. Leaders. Hello. He said that they send them to spy out the land and to bring us a report. So they go, and when they went, the Bible says that they collected some of the, they got some grapes, because it was the time of grapes, you know, being ripe. So they grabbed some grapes, and they had to carry it. The Bible says that they carry between two guys, they carry it with a stick in the middle. And between them, they had to carry the cluster of grapes, because they were so big, so, so wonderful. So they brought them back, but when they came back, the Bible tells us in Numbers 
that also one of the things that they focused on was not the great life that was awaiting them as they made it through or as they made it there. But the Bible tells us they begin to focus and concentrate on the type of people that lived in that area. They begin to say, you know, yeah, the fruit is good. Here, here, here. there's proof of that right here. But, but, but. Every time we get the butt in there, something bad is going to happen. But the people there are giants. These giants live in this area. These other giants live in this area. These other giants live in this area. And, and, and there's no way that we can go and take that land because there's so many giants there. In fact, they begin to say, you know, uh, to tell you the truth, we, we looked as grasshoppers in comparison to them. And they saw us as grasshoppers as well. How did they know that? Come on now. That's what they were thinking. So see, the attitude that they had. As God told them that that land belonged to them was a bad, negative attitude. Attitude comes from what you see and how you see it. Attitude comes from what you see and how you see it. See, they went there and they saw something. And when they came back, the thing that they saw over there, the giants, injected them with fear. And because they were afraid, their attitude began to come out as a negative attitude because of what they saw. They saw the opposition. They saw the impossibilities. They saw the big challenges, the problems, the giants. So they came back and gave, gave a bad report. Now, let, let, let me tell you this. I preach a message that is called Scarecrow. Hello, somebody. The Scarecrow. Scarecrow in the middle of the strawberry patch. You guys remember that, right? He's the same thing. This is what was happening here. You can go and you ask one of those, one of those birds, what? A, a crow, you can go. And you see a bird on top of a tree. You can see a bird on the rooftop of a house. You can see one of those birds on the, on the top of a fence surrounding the, the strawberry patch. But now one of those birds would dare to fly and to get any of the red strawberries, juicy, sweet strawberries, simply because there is a scarecrow in the middle of the field. And you can go and you can ask, hey, how come you're not going over there to get those nice strawberries? You see those strawberries over there? Why don't you go? You're really hungry. It was in, <laughs> no. Why don't you go get it? Go get strawberry. You're hungry, right? I'm starving. Why don't you go just get it? Look at, look at, look at how many they got. No, no. Why? Look, look, look. I'm not pointing at you, Art, okay? I'm just, I'm just, look, look, look. Why don't you go and eat? Get all the strawberries that you want because of that, that over there. Look. That's not going to do nothing to you. You know what the scarecrow is? It's just a, it's just a penalty that Mundo used to wear a long time ago. It's just a cholo penalty that is on there. And a hat that Art used to wear a long time ago. That's all it is. He's got a stick in the middle and that's it. But there's nobody there. No, 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 no. I'm scared. Are you hungry? I'm starving. Why don't you go eat? Look, look, look. I'm not pointing at you, Eugene. I'm just saying. Look. You see, the need may be great. Your desire can be great. But sometimes we're afraid of something that's not even there. Sometimes we don't eat to what God has for us. Sometimes we don't walk into God's purposes for our lives. Sometimes we don't see God's promises come to pass in our life simply because we're pointing at a scarecrow that can do nothing to you. Ah, Jesus. 
can do nothing to you, can do nothing to us. It's just an attitude of fear that for some reason, oh, I don't know if I do this, something is going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And we're already afraid to move forward because we know something bad is going to happen. If I start giving and I can become committed to my ties, I'm not going to be able to have enough to be able to pay my bills. Really? Talk to some of the tithers and, and, and watch what they tell you and how God has come through. Not only to meet their needs, but beyond their How do they do it? It is an attitude. It's not that we don't have money. It's not that we're not working. It is that sometimes our attitude. We get this fear. We are scarecrow, scarecrow, scarecrow is not even going to do nothing to you. Cannot even move or do nothing. Step out and do what God called you to do. Sometimes we don't get involved. Oh, if I get involved, no. I cannot serve in the church because poor me, poor me. I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> poor me. How was it? <laughs> you know how I grew up, Pastor Jose? <laughs> and? I'm serious. There's, a, there's something, and the vision is great, and God has a great plan. God comes. The Bible tells us. And God comes. He sends an angel. And here's this young man. The Bible says he was hiding from the Midianites. And he's hiding from the Midianites, and he's got a little bit of rice, a little bit of corn, some things there, a little, a little, a little bit. And he's hiding it, and... and, and, and and the angel appeared to him and says, what are you doing here, you mighty men of valor? And this young man is hiding. And the Bible says that he looked at him. And then he says, oh, I'm hiding from the Midianites. I'm protecting my little food here. Because the Midianites, I don't want them seeing us right now. Because every time they see that I got a little bit of food, a little bit of corn, a little bit of rice, they come and they take everything from me. <laughs> Poor me. The Bible says that God looked at him, that angel looked at him, and he says, I want you to go and fight with the might and the power that I'm giving you, I am calling you. Listen, listen, listen. This man had a perception, a, a poor me mentality. The Bible says that when God, when the angel told him, I want you to go, I want you to fight, I'm going to give you the victory, that he says, why me? He says, I belong to this family, the least of the land. My family is the most, the poorest family out of all of the families. And within my family, I'm the least of my family. I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm the worst of my brothers and sisters. Oh, my family is the worst. And I'm the words of my family and you're talking to me poor me oh no you don't know me you don't know what i'm talking what you're talking about don't you know that i can't do nothing and god says no this is the way that i see you you need to begin to see what i see i see you with so much potential i see you as the answer i see you as the answer not only for your family but for the whole country. Hey, come on. Somebody need to give him praise. He had an attitude of fear. Hiding. Poor me. But he wasn't able to see the way that God was seeing him. See, God saw his potential. God saw his ability. And God saw that this man had it in him to lead not only a small army, but the entire army of Israel to be able to overtake the Midianites and to stop the problem for good and forever. God saw what was inside of this man. This man had a wrong perception of who he was. He was seen at the outside, the outer appearance. He was acting in fear. But God says, I'm here to wake you up of who you are. 
I want you to open your eyes and see who you really are. I'm going to use your life for my honor and glory. I will use you to deliver Israel from the Midian. Come on, somebody here, God. He's going to use you. Somebody here, God's going to wake you up to do what God has called you to do. Come on, give him a good praise. Hallelujah. All I can do is shout. But you got to make your decision. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to inspire you. I'm here to preach the truth of the word of God. But it's up to you to turn the button on or turn it off. I pray that you will turn it on today. That you will say, you know what, man? I'm going to pursue what God, what God has for my life. My attitude is going to begin to change from this moment on. It's going to begin to change from this moment on. You see, my friend. Your attitude has to do with what you see and how you see it. Gideon saw all this happening, and the way that he took it, he created fear in his heart. So he started to protect him, and to protect him the little bit that he had, instead of thinking about expansion, growth, takeover, victory, because of the way he perceived everything that was taking place. But God saw it at a different level. And God says, if you begin to see yourself the way that I see you, you're going to be a giant in the faith. Big difference, big difference. And it has to do with attitude. It has to do with our attitude, every one of us. See, God's promise was right there within the reach of the people of, of God. They went into the promised land and they saw it. It was right there. No giants and no devils could stop them from taking it if they decided to take it. Ooh, Jesus. When they went and saw everything that they saw there, nobody could stop them from, from taking the land at that time if they decided to do it. But because of their attitude of fear, they came back and they said, we cannot do it. It was their negative, defeated attitude that denied their blessings. Hello, somebody. Denied their blessings. You begin to say, I don't have what it takes. You begin to say, I can't participate. But I want to let you know that as that little boy said, Hey, Dad, don't worry about it. We're coming out to bat next. And watch what's going to happen. We may be down right now, but we're not staying down. See, time and time again, the people of God, every time that they face any challenge, they will respond with a negative attitude. This is what they said in Numbers 14, verse 3, as I get ready to get ready to continue. Numbers 14, verse 3, this is what they said. He says, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Would it, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? <laughs> Jesus. Some people get so negative and say, man, it's better if I was in the world. Better if I was in the world drinking my pistol. Oh, shut up. They wanted to go back to Egypt where they were slaves and had no rights, had no say-so, had nothing. And they're, they're thinking about, hey, wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? And this is what they said to each other. We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They said, hey, let's disconnect from this vision. Hello, somebody. <laughs> let's disconnect from this plan, man. Let's just go ahead and let's, let's raise up a leader ourselves and then go back to Egypt. That's a great plan. Let's go back to be slaves again. That's a wonderful idea. How dumb, huh? The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard, I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, 
I will do to you the very things that I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Hijo, ay, 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 ay. You want to keep your bad negative attitude? In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. You're going to die here. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who was grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land that I saw with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephne, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for you, listen to this, as for your children that you said will be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But listen, listen to this. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here in the desert for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. God had enough of their negative attitude. And he said they continued to do that with a negative attitude. I had given them a promise and they were ready to move in, but because of their negative attitude, not one of you will enter here and two things that would happen because of your negative attitude, he told them. And that is real, and that is true for every one of us. A negative attitude kills every possibility of walking in God's promises. A negative attitude kills every possibility of walking in God's promises. You're going to die in a desert without entering into the promise, he says. Hundreds of thousands died in the wilderness, and with them, the possibility of ever seeing God's promises fulfilled in their lives. And the second thing that happened here is that a negative attitude brings unnecessary suffering to your children. Oh, Jesus. A negative attitude on your part, sir, ma'am, brother, sister. A negative attitude on your part bring unnecessary suffering to your children. If you don't have children, to those loved ones around you, to your family. The Bible says in verse 33, your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. See, the fulfillment of any God-given dream begins with acquiring the right attitude. If you get the right attitude, man, the next step, you're ready for the next step. But you got to have the right attitude. You got to see yourself the way that God sees you to be able to move forward and accomplish God's purposes for your life. Got to be able to understand what does God see in me? How does he see me? It's important to have the right attitude, the right understanding. You can't say, man, I see myself as a grasshopper. Too small for the challenges at hand. You can't do that. You will never move forward. Do yourself a favor and read your Bible and learn to see yourself as God sees you. Some of you have the wrong attitude because you have the wrong view about yourself. Change that, and you will change the world. Oh, Jesus. Oh, change that, and you will change the world. The world changes the minute you turn the switch on to a good attitude instead of a negative attitude. There's two unhealthy views about self, about seeing yourself. Two unhealthy ones. One, the grasshopper view. You're very insecure. Poor me. I'm so insignificant. That's what the grasshopper view says. Like Gideon, we talked about that. But then there's another one. I call it the Naaman mentality or the view. Naaman was a man, the Bible tells in 2 Kings 5.1. Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a violent soldier, he says, but he had leprosy. This man was like up here, but he had an issue. He had a problem. He had a need. He had leprosy. The Bible tells us in verse 9, So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to, 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 say, a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. Is the other mentality, proudful mentality. It will stop you from reaching your full potential. Naaman went away angry and says, I thought that he would surely come out. The prophet will come out to me and stand and roll the red carpet 
Oh, no, he doesn't say that. And stand and call on the name of his God, his Lord. Wave his hand over my spot where I have the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, leprosy. And cure me of the leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. He was upset. He went to get the healing from the prophet. And the prophet sent a messenger outside. He says, go and tell them to do this. The brother got upset. He thought he was too good. He had a lot of pride. A lot of people that think they are too good can never reach their full potential in God. They walk around with their nose up in the air. Everybody's dumb. Everybody's stupid except them. Have you met anybody like that? They're always just with their head up. They got no time to explain nothing because everybody should know everything because they know it. They think they're know-it-all. Can I tell you something? You can say goodbye to the promises. You will never reach a promise like that. You're going to have an attitude of humility. You're going to humble yourself. You're going to say, God, help me. I got this leprosy in me. And I'm going to die unless you heal me. See, you begin to look at God for who he is. And you begin to say, I'm nothing without God. I am just like everybody else in the kingdom. But God has a calling upon my life. I will trust in the Lord. Name a servant. Went to him after he was upset. And he says, well, why can't I go to another river? I can go to another river where the water is more clean, and I can go there, and I can get healed, right? Why did he send me to Damascus, to the river there? That, that water is dirty. Ew. The servant girl who was a Christian, hello, somebody. When, it says, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great things or some difficult thing, would you not have done it to get healed? How much more then? When he tells you, wash and be cleansed. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him to. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. He almost missed his miracle because of a bad, ugly, negative, proudful, know-it-all attitude. That's it. But he had the power, the ability from God to turn it off. The servant girl, the Christian says, Master, as I have the keyboard player come up, Master, if he would ask you to do something impossible to get healed, like go and fight by yourself against a hundred soldiers, you probably would have said, I'm going to go do it because I want to get healed. But he asked you to do something very simple. And now that he asks you to do something very simple to get your healing, you think that you know more than him. You think you know more than the prophet now. Now you're telling him what water is you going to go and wash yourself instead of, what, instead of what he said to you. Why don't you just obey what he said? Why don't you just humble yourself and see the miracle of God in your life? Don't miss out on what God has for you because of your attitude. I pray today, I really do. I pray that there will be an attitude in the church of humility like never before. Like never before. I pray for our young people especially. Our young people. Our young people sometimes, they, 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 they just move forward. They love God. But they bypass this, this area a lot of times where, where they're working with people and they... they they see others and they don't, they don't want to take their time because, because they're smart, because they know a lot. I pray there will be a, a, a revelation where God begins to show and say, look, I want to do great things in you and through you. I want, I want to use your life in such a powerful way. But you might begin to trigger some things inside of you that only you have access to. Change that. You make it easier for yourself in accomplishing everything that God called you to accomplish. Seeing the vision from God come to pass in your life 
requires some adjustments and some changes to our attitude. Come on, just stand to your feet and lift up your hands. Come on, just lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. The first step to see the vision that God is giving you, personal vision, come to pass. The first step is the right attitude. You must acquire the right attitude. Oh, Jesus, we pray, Lord. Come on, just lift up your hands right where you're at right now. God is here. The presence of God is right here, so heavy. And I believe if you desire, if you desire, if you desire to turn things around in your life, your work, place of employment, your ministry, every area of your life, it begins by acquiring the right attitude from God. If it's you today here and God minister, I want you to come. I want you to come out of your seat. Come, sir, ma'am, brother, sister, come, 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 come. You said, I need help, God. I need help. It begins right here. I want to see the vision come to pass. I'm not going to be negative, God. I want to change.